Well, it's, it's not just television, is it? Um, I went to boarding school as a teenager, and near my boarding school was this, in Shropshire in the, in the Midlands, was this um, road that was sort of locally known as the Cursed Road or the Ghost Road. And um, at, at certain times of the year, at certain times of day, there were a disproportionate number of car accidents along this road. And um, it turned out, you know, when, when this was kind of investigated and somebody applied some thought to it, that the, 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 the trees were very regularly planted down one side of this road. And sort of in the autumn, you know, when the, when the sun was low in the sky at sort of five o'clock, knocking off time or whatever, um, at about 30 or 35 miles an hour, the flickering was enough to, in some people, induce a photoepileptic seizure. And, and, and so a disproportionate number of people crashed their cars on that road. And the way they solved it was they just chopped down every, every third tree. And, and suddenly the problem went away. Suddenly that repetitive flashing pattern of the sun you know, coming through the trees was gone. And, um, and so photosensitive epilepsy is, is it's a medical uh, thing uh, where, where visual disturbance at just the right frequency can upset um, uh, you know, the processes that go in your brain and it can lead to a, a seizure. It's not, it's not like epilepsy where people who really suffer from that condition you know, are out for a long time, but it can cause momentary you know, disorientation and, and loss of consciousness. And I suppose it's been known about in television for quite a long time. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the program that everybody points to as being the one that um, kind of brought this to light was an episode of Pokemon, um, you know, the Japanese anime uh, show, which I've just got up on screen at the moment, the YouTube clip. Um, and uh, if, you, if you've ever watched it, you can see exactly why it should be problematic. There's, there's a sequence where you've got very rapid interfield, interframe flashing between uh, red and blue. And, uh, and you know, you could see that if somebody was prone to a seizure from that kind of thing, that would be the thing to trigger it. Um, and, and so I suppose in the late 90s, early noughties, I first became aware of it, that Ofcom were getting quite hot on this. And in fact, the first year of Big Brother, which was 2000, um, we had uh, photo, we had PSE detectors in our edit suites then, um, and uh, uh, it's kind of you know be becoming more important since. You, yeah, the, the, there's a very good Wikipedia article on, on, on it, which I've just popped up, um, and uh, one of the world's sort of renowned experts in the field is this guy called uh, Dr. Graham Harding, who. Um, uh, you know, is, 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 is well respected and knows, you know, obviously did a lot of research in this area, but we'll talk about him a bit later um, because uh, he's, you know, he's significant in, in, in this arena. Um, I've just stuck up the, um, up the page from the Ofcom guidance, notes on flashing images and regular patterns in television. Um, so the, this is the uh, revised in 2005. There's been a later revision, 2009, but this is, this is the appendix for that, and I don't have the appendix for the 2009 um, uh, update. So it, 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 what it talks about is a potentially harmful flash, so it's sometimes referred to as a flash event. And it says a flash event is an increase in luminance followed by a decrease, or a decrease in luminance followed by an increase of at least 20 candelas per meter squared or more uh, between successive frames of video. So well, I've, I've I isolated three frames of video, which I'm just going to stick up now. Um, and all of all the clips I'm going to use this evening, I grabbed off telly last week from the you know, the royal birth. And the thing that that often um, shows up, uh, you know, these flash events most exactly paparazzi pictures. Yeah? So so I'm just I'm just framing through three frames of video now, and it's it's a it's a car parked outside uh, the. Um, is it St Mary's, I think, the hospital where that where, where the royal baby was born, and uh, and and. The first frame uh, is, is normally illuminated by the early evening daylight, and the second frame is massively illuminated by uh, the, the, the flash of a photographer's camera, and then the third frame returns to being very similar to the first frame. And it's that momentary huge change in a picture um, that, that, that is, is a flash event. Now, the, the Ofcom specs, if I go back to that, the Ofcom spec says um, that... Um, Oh, it's right at the very end. Let's come back to the beginning. It, it, it says that one flash event or two flash events or even three flash events are okay. But if you have more than three flash events within nine frames, then, uh, then that's a violation. And so, so that's, a, that's a very simple um, uh, description of what's allowed. If, if you imagine if you were Mr. Tektronix or somebody else who made video test equipment, it would be very easy to implement that in software. And in fact, in the early noughties, there were several manufacturers that, 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 that made um, uh, you know, flash detecting machines. So the one that was my favourite was the, was the Gordon, the, the Flash Gordon it was called, made by um, 
uh, BPR broadcast product research. And um, as I say, when when um, when I was working on Big Brother, we had one in several edit suites, and it was a great machine because it just takes video in and time code in. And when it detects a flash violation, it honks you know a, a beeper and freezes the time code on the display. And the editor can go back and do something about it. You can, can scroll back over his timeline and say, oh, if I shorten the shot by two or three frames each end, then, then I can get my sequence in under the, the specification. Um, so it was a splendid machine. Um, but for reasons we'll talk about a little bit later, um, uh, you know, they're, they're no longer really a big player in the market. And it's, it's, it's really more down to um, uh, 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 Harding now. He's, he's the only game in town, really. So, uh, well, whereas before I had at the Ofcom spec, I've now popped up the DPP spec. Now, the DPP is, as we, you know, we'll refer you back to our, uh, our file-based um, QC podcast, but the DPP spec is kind of coming in, becoming very important, and it's, it's what will govern television delivery, really, from the second half of this year onwards. And um, in section three of that, it, it, it reiterates what Ofcom says. In fact, it's exactly the same wording, and so here it is up on screen now. 20 candelas per meter squared or more difference across the three frames. So the middle frame is more than 20 candelas per meter squared different. But you say to yourself, well, hang on a second. How on earth do you know how the punter's television has been calibrated? You know, I, I know that, that the, the BBC will specify 80 candelas per meter squared for peak white. And again, we'll refer you back to our calibrating monitors episode. Um, but how on earth... Do you know, how can you specify that? Because you don't know, you know how people's televisions are calibrated. That seems ridiculous. And, and that's true. And in fact, I've got a, a picture of yours truly up on the screen, calibrating a, a Sony um, monitor. Uh, and, but it's that kind of gadget you have to use to tell you, you know, the peak white coming off uh, a monitor's surface. There's no way you can tell that, apart from having a, an instrument to measure it. Um, but the, uh, the Ofcom guidance notes are, you know, come to our rescue, because what they say is, they say, let me find the page... Uh, that, well, they, they say, so video waveform luminance is not a direct measurement of screen brightness because obviously televisions and monitors are calibrated differently. Not all domestic display devices have the same gamma characteristic, but a display with a gamma of 2.2, very standard for television, can be assumed for the purposes of this um, exercise. And it says, um, on, on average, we assume that a domestic television is calibrated for 200 candelas per meter squared peak white. So an awful lot more, an awful lot brighter than a... Um, than a broadcast monitor, but um, uh, you know that's the assumption we make that, that 200 candelas per meter squared is what the peak white of a, broad, of, a of a domestic television will be calibrated to, and that's that's probably quite fair. Um, you know, that it's kind of it's in that ballpark, and so that means that the yeah, well, uh, as, as you know. Um, you know, when we had, all had CRTs at home, 100 candelas per meter squared would have been considered quite a bright telly. And it wasn't unusual for you to close your curtains to, to watch the telly, in the, in the daytime at least. But you don't really do that anymore with a plasma or an LCD. So modern tellies are driven a lot brighter. But I suppose on the other side, um, a, an LCD doesn't pulse in the same way that a CRT does. A CRT has built-in kind of flicker. And that's known to exacerbate um, photosensitive epilepsy. So horses for courses. Modern tellies are a lot brighter, and so it, you know they are perhaps more likely to provoke PSE. But then again, they don't have the built-in kind of flickeriness that a CRT does. So um, uh, yes. So, so once once we kind of you know re reach this specification of we're allowed a 20 candela per meter squared difference between frames. And we're assuming a 200 candela per meter squared calibration for peak white point for a domestic television. Then uh, you know we have something that, that can be tested electronically. You know if if we if we're going between you know uh, a good frame and a fending frame and a good frame. You know if there's more than 10% luminance difference between those frames. In fact, the picture I've got up, I've got I've got the little um, histogram window next to it, and you can see that really is a bit more than 10% difference. You know, it's quite quite gross. Um, so that would be a flash event, and, and kind of three of those inside nine frames, and that would be a no-no. Um, and in fact, here's um, here's a little graph they give at the end of the Ofcom document, with with gamma applied and uh, you know um, video voltage along the x-axis and light output in candelas per meter squared up the y-axis. But of course, you know we're back into this thing of who who uses analog video anymore? You know, but but of course by common consent we regard. Um, even digital video to be representational of a voltage. But there you go. Um, so 
uh, as I said, you know, back in the early noughties, there were there were several machines you could buy. There was Chromatech had a machine, um, a BPR had the Flash Gordon that was very good. But the, the the machine that became very popular was the Harding FPA. Now, the 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 thing about the Harding was that. Um, uh, as I say, Mr. Harding is considered to be something of a uh, uh, of a um, uh, an authority in the area. You know, he's got lots of published papers. And in fact, if I, if I just go back to the um, to the um, uh, the Ofcom document, half the references in there are are to papers written by Mr. Harding. And so nobody doubts his his um, you know ability in the area. But the problem is that his machine uh, does a whole bunch of extra stuff that 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 the Ofcom spec doesn't call for, and uh, the, the, the flash cord and other machines can't don't, don't test for. Um, he tests for sort of quite elaborate sort of red patterning and things like um, uh, um, uh, repetitive patterns and, 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 and things that nobody else really knows what he's doing. Uh, and so consequently, uh, when the BBC and Channel 4 and Red B Media and lots of other people sort of embraced the Harding as their, their box of choice, of course, if you're, a, if you're a facility delivering to one of those big broadcast companies, you now have to have a Harding as well. Seems a bit iniquitous, really. Uh, you know, you could say, well, hang on, I invested all this money in, in, in my Gordon machine. Now, the Gordons weren't expensive by comparison. Um, the standard def machines are only about £1,000, and the high def machine is only £3,000. Mr. Harding will charge you thirteen thousand pounds for his machine, uh, uh, but but if I want to deliver to Red B or to the BBC, well, I've got to I've got to have this more expensive machine because it's testing for a bunch of stuff that nobody else tests for. And truth to tell, um, the regulator doesn't call for, but it seems to be he's kind of inserted himself and and he's in a position to to now um, you know call the shots. It, it, it doesn't seem quite right somehow. It sounds that way, doesn't it? So I did a bit of a bit of a um, a straw poll of friends at um, uh, facilities, uh, a broadcast facility, about a year ago. This was um, so Ascent Media, who at the time were doing Channel 5's uh, delivery, um, uh, you know, Coding and Mux, um, they have the Gordon as their um, sort of day-to-day -day machine. Uh, uh, an ITV's QC department, Upper Ground, use the Gordon as their first pass analyzer. Uh, Channel 4 have it internally as well. But they all specify Harding to external facilities companies, which seems like, you know, doubly iniquitous. Um, you know, um, now if you imagine that the Harding for a long, long time, um, you'd have to play the finished program into it, have it do an analysis pass of the file that had been created, and then you handed the, 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 the resultant um, report back to the editor, and he'd have to kind of sort it out. Uh, it's only been very, very recently they've had a real-time machine that can, that can analyze in real time. And, um, and so if you imagine you've got like a, a half hour program, it takes half an hour to play it into the machine. Uh, until quite recently, they all processed in slower than real time. So just to do a single flash, pa flash analysis of a, of a program would take two or three times the length of the program by virtue of that you've got to play it in, analyze it, and give the report back to the editor. Whereas with the Gordon, you know, it could just sit there in the edit suite beeping when it detected a violation. So, you know. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful because the DPP spec um, which everybody's getting behind, um, uh, really is um, um, specifying uh, Ofcom as, as, as the preferred um, testing regime and, and, and not Harding. No. So, so we just kind of hope that, 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 um, that they'll pick up on it. Yes, exactly. So the other... So as I say, there are still things you can buy that will do flash analysis. That, that aren't a Harding box. Um, VidChecker, my, my, my favourite um, software-based video QC tool, which we which we did our which I, we did our, our, our file-based QC episode on, and um, that does flash analysis. And I've just popped up the um, the menu item from VidChecker that shows um, what it's testing for, and it's got just a couple of little presets. Um, there's a, apparently a, a standard and a strict test. The standard looks very much like the Ofcom, and the strict uh, looks a bit more like Harding. Um, and then it's got a couple of check boxes, check for saturated red flashes or check for potentially harmful regular patterns. And, and this is kind of Harding light. This is them trying to ape what they suspect um, Harding does. So the top part of the, of the dialogue is, is gets you to Ofcom and the bottom part is kind of, you know, we're trying to ape Harding. Um, but I, I spoke to the product manager at um, Tektronix who's responsible for the WVR and WFM series uh, scopes. 
and he said they've had beta software um, for ages, um, but uh, they, they've, they're, they're loath to put it out there because um, either people won't bother using it because it's not harding, and then that would be a waste of money, or um, uh, they make it a bit more capable and a bit more like Harding, and in which case Harding comes down hard on them because the, he's got lots of patents in this area. So, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a tricky one, and we hope that uh, DPP will kind of, you know, set it all to rights, as it were. <laughs> so I've I've got a bit of video here, which um, I grabbed off air the same evening as I did that that that, that bit of BBC News Twenty Four. This is um, a clip from Sky News, and just listen. I, I, I don't know if you can hear the audio return, Hugh. Um, but um, uh, so, so I'll just, just, what, what the newscaster she says she, the first thing she says is um, just a warning that um, this this report ca has lots of flash photography in it. Delighted. A warning: this report from Sky's royal correspondent Paul Harrison contains flash photography. In case you didn't know, it was spelled out. So we'll out just let that play platform. through for um, a few minutes, oh, no, a few seconds, because this first shot. Is, is, is of a town cry standing outside the hospital and there's lots and lots of flash photography going on. Um, uh, you know, every few frames has got lots of flashing going on. So I'll just pause that and move it out of the way onto the other monitor there. And in fact, I've got up on screen now the, the report um, when I analysed this piece of video um, from VidChecker. And we, uh, I, all I did with VidChecker, I, I made a template where I just turned on PSE analysis. Um, and we can see it's exactly what we would expect. So for that clip uh, from 12 seconds into 14 seconds in, up to nine flashes per second, at least 20 candelas per meter squared, covering 48 to 64%. Of the, you know, and it's all it's all flash events that have been logged here. And in fact, they're all the way through. So if I spin past the the shot of the um, the town crier, uh, and let's see if I can find another another flashy part. Okay, so yeah, looks like a, a royal spokesman coming out of the hospital. So let's put that back there. And yeah, look, that's very obviously um, kind of a violation. So obviously live television, you know, you're bedeviled by the fact that you've got quick turnaround packages that you have to play in and, and you might not have had the opportunity to, to, to do any meaningful flash pattern analysis. So I've just got another clip as well, which I grabbed off, um, same evening again, off Al Jazeera. Now, as you'd expect, they didn't feature the royal baby quite as much, uh, but I did manage to find one bit of, uh, of, of the Al Jazeera coverage. So it's just the, um, it's the presenter doing her, her piece of camera in the studio, and they, they go to the VT package. And um, interestingly, they, although they do have some um, uh, uh, shots with flash photography in, so the one, the one up at the moment has, has some flash photography in notch. They've also got a shot outside the hospital with a tiny bit of flash photography, but not much. Um, and then again, spokesman coming out of the hospital, talking to somebody in a car, and there is some flash photography, but it's kind of off to one side of the frame. Um, and, and then I don't think there's anything interesting in the rest of it, so let's pause that and take that off screen. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, when I ran the same PSC analysis using VidCheck on that, it didn't throw up a single um, uh, flashing error. So it is entirely possible to, to, to do um, that kind of stuff without violating it, but it, you know, you, your choice of material really, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I, th but I think it just, you, you, you are allowed to cover yourself by, by giving that little warning at the head of the piece, isn't it? You know, flash photography from the outset, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's that. Yes, although interestingly, um, you know, the United States, you know, you could argue they're the most litigious country in the world, you know, and, and, and yet they have no standards governing PSE. Yeah, it just ha hasn't caught on there at all. Um, uh, very significant in Europe um, and Japan, but, uh, but not so much in other parts of the world. So, you know, I, I, I really don't know what to make of it. I've never, I've never personally felt nauseous um, from... Um, from, from witnessing it myself, although, you know, clearly there is material to suggest that, that some people do suffer 